In the last few years, millions of dollars have been made by people investing their money in the stock market. Overnight, those who have wisely chosen their stocks have reaped a fortune. On the other hand, in one day recently, one of the world's richest men lost $12 billion. The things of this world are very much like a bubble that grows rapidly, and then in a moment, it's gone. People are seeking something stable or permanent. But where can we find security for the present and the future? God never intended that you and I would have to worry about the present or the future. If we would only trust in Him and His plans for us, we would never have to worry about or fear what's going to happen to us. Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Matthew 6, 31 and 32. Let's take a look at God's eternal security plan for us. It all started back in the Garden of Eden. Planet Earth had just come from the Creator's hands in all its splendor and perfection, glorious beyond description. The stroke of the master artist greeted the eye at every turn. Magnificent sunrises were rivaled only by breathtaking sunsets. Peaceful lakes nestled between the hills. Gorgeous flowers of every hue and blossoming vines delighted the senses. Trees were drooping with a load of delicious fruit of every kind. Songbirds filled the air with their melodious songs. Animals in the lush meadows played and roamed unafraid. The streams and lakes were alive with beautifully colored fish. What a paradise, from pole to pole. How much Adam and Eve must have enjoyed the perfect world God had made for his children. But there was more. The Lord God planted a garden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Genesis 2, 8. Just think, somewhere amid the wonder and beauty of the newborn world, God designed a garden home for Adam and Eve. The most lavish home on earth cannot begin to compare with the world's original garden home. Not only did God provide a lovely home for them, He also explained the wonderful food He had provided for them. I have given you every herb that yields seed which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. Genesis 1.29 Adam and Eve had no rent to pay, no taxes to worry about, no locks or keys, no vandals or burglars, no hospitals or drugstores. They enjoyed perfect health and endless youth, undying commitment to each other, and a boundless love for God. God wanted them to share these blessings, so He said, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Genesis 1.28 We are stewards of God's property. It was God's design that one big, happy, healthy family inhabit planet earth. God also knew that mankind should have a challenge, employment, a task that He would be responsible for and enjoy the pleasure of accomplishing. So He told Adam and Eve, Have dominion over the fish of the sea over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. Genesis 1, 28 and 2, 15. While the bounty of this world is God's and His alone, He entrusted mankind with a stewardship of the earth. God is the owner of planet earth and everything in it. We are but stewards, managing God's property. The Bible says, The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. Psalm 24, 1. Again, God says, For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the field are mine. Psalm 50, 10, and 11. And it is God who gives us the ability to make money. To put it simply, we really don't own anything. As our Creator, God has a prior claim on our possessions and us. And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you power to get wealth, that He may establish His covenant which He swore to your fathers as it is this day. Deuteronomy 8:18. 8, the Concise Oxford Dictionary defines steward as a person entrusted with the management of another's property. Today, when a person enters into a stewardship relationship, he wants to know what the owner expects of him. This is the understanding God had with Adam, for the Bible states, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, 
But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Genesis 2, 16 and 17. God tested man's love and loyalty through this one restriction. Adam and Eve could eat from all the other trees in the garden, but they were not to eat of the fruit of that specific tree. By obeying God, they would show their recognition of His ownership. If they were faithful stewards and chose to maintain their allegiance to God, they would live forever in a world that was a paradise. Adam and Eve, with the hope of the whole world before them, failed the one simple test God required of them. They were unfaithful stewards, and they lost everything. Their garden home, immortality, love, happiness, security, clear consciences, and face-to-face -face walks and talks with God. They slipped from heirs to slaves, and from blessings to curses. And watching behind it all in sadistic satisfaction was Satan, the rebel angel who hoped to have full control of earth forever. However, Satan's assumption was shattered by Christ's entrance into the world centuries later. Presuming to deceive the divine Son of God as easily as he had tricked the first couple, Satan waited until Jesus had fasted for forty days. Then he took him up to an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world, saying, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Matthew 4, 8 and 9. All these things were the lure. But Satan's deception didn't go over with Jesus as it had in the Garden of Eden. The things that he had promised to give Christ were not his to give. He had hijacked a planet by fraud and deceit. And Jesus would not sell out his relationship with his Father for the whole world of wealth and glitter. Ultimately, Satan's fate was forever sealed at Calvary. By Christ's death on the cross, Satan was defeated. Christ's death made possible the restoration of planet Earth. Thus, everything we are or have comes stamped with a cross made possible by Christ's eternal gift to human beings. Whether we love and serve Him or not, our very lives and all our possessions are His property. Not only is He our Creator, He is our Redeemer. And just like Adam and Eve, we are stewards of what God entrusts to us, and as such are required to be found faithful. 1 Corinthians 4, 2. We are stewards of God's gift of life. The greatest of all God's gifts is one we often take for granted, the very life that surges through our bodies. Writes Paul, God, who made the world and everything in it, gives to all life, breath, and all things. Acts 17, 24, and 25. Our life originates with God, and He sustains it. Every heartbeat, every breath of air, every pulse of our bodies is a gift from God. Paul wrote, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Romans 12, 1. A living sacrifice means unreserved commitment or submission to Christ and His leadership in our lives. He is our example. We are to follow His example. Unselfish service, going about doing good. Acts 10:38. We are not only stewards of money, we are also stewards of our time. Someone has said that time is the stuff life is made of. The psalmist requested of God, So teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Psalm 90, 12. To waste time is to waste life, to squander that talent which God Himself has given to each man and woman. Every person has the same number of hours in a day, the same number of minutes in those hours, and will be held accountable for the choices made to fill them. And while God expects that we use our time wisely in a general sense, He also expects us to set aside a specific time period, the Sabbath, the seventh day of the week, as a means of expressing our belief in Him as our Creator. God asks that one-seventh of our time be devoted to fellowship with Him resting in His Word, drawing refreshment from His promises, putting aside the weekly pressures of work, shopping, and worldly pursuits, and remembering Him as our Creator and Redeemer. We are stewards of the talents God gives us. Well, you ask, what are the specific talents for which we are responsible as God's stewards? I don't think I have any talents. 
Today, the word talent usually means the ability to sing well, play an instrument, paint a picture, sew a dress, write, or organize. These are talents, to be sure. But the talents God had in mind were not limited to these. As God's stewards, we are responsible for everything He gives us, including life, time, abilities, and possessions. God will ask us whether we have used these talents to enrich ourselves and satisfy our whims and pleasures, or to bless others. Jesus said, Follow me. He lived unselfishly. The Bible says, He went about doing good. Acts 10.38 Most of us are content to just go about. Our talents are not to be used to get the praise of men or to earn merit with God. They are loaned to us to bless others. Paul wrote, And what do you have that you did not receive? Now if you did indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? 1 Corinthians 4, 7 We are stewards of the money God gives us. As we seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, Matthew 6, 33, we discover that all of God's blessings are showered upon us. In addition to giving of our time, we find in Scripture that dedication to God means giving also of our means, acknowledging the source of our material blessings by returning to God His portion. When the Elamites, a neighboring hostile tribe, invaded and overthrew Sodom, Abraham's nephew Lot, along with many others with their families and possessions, was taken captive. When the news reached Abraham, he determined to rescue Lot and the others, praying for God to be with him and give him success. Not only did God give him the release of Lot and his family, but he also delivered over to him the captors along with their treasures. When Abraham returned, the king of Sodom came out to meet him, urging him to keep the treasures he had recovered, only returning the captives. But Abraham refused to take gain for himself. Melchizedek, a priest of God, brought Abraham a meal and blessed him. Then Abraham gave him a tithe of all. Genesis 14.20 Abraham wanted to express his appreciation for God's help in securing the release of Lot, acknowledging God's ownership and blessings. 150 years later, Abraham's grandson expressed his gratitude to God in the same way. While fleeing from his angry brother, Jacob felt utterly alone and afraid. He desperately wanted the protection of his God, but he felt so guilty for robbing his brother Esau that he feared God had forsaken him and would not forgive him. With a great sense of remorse, Jacob confessed his wrongs to God and then wearily lay down on the ground and slept. Then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to heaven, and there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Genesis 28, 12. When Jacob awoke, he knew God had spoken, promising guidance and protection. Deeply touched, he gratefully promised, Of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. Verse 22. King David felt the same way when he asked, What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits toward me? Psalm 116, 12. Have you ever wondered how to thank God for His incredible goodness to you, for the gift of life, family, health, material blessings? Do you sometimes wonder if thank you is enough? The Bible principle of stewardship provides a tangible way of expressing our appreciation to God for all His benefits. Jacob said he would return to God a tenth or tithe of all he received, just as his grandfather Abraham had done. The first written instruction regarding tithing or returning a tenth to the Lord is recorded in the book of Leviticus. And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. Leviticus 27.30 As we return a tenth of all we earn, we are continually impressed with the truth that God is the Creator and the source of every blessing. And how is the tithe to be used? The book of Numbers gives a clear explanation. I have given the children of Levi, ministers in the service of God, all the tithes in Israel as an inheritance in return for the work which they perform, the work of the tabernacle of meeting. Numbers 18.21 
Throughout the Bible, we find that the tithe always supported the work of God. In the New Testament, Paul explains, Do you not know that those who minister the holy things eat of the things of the temple, and those who serve at the altar partake of the offerings of the altar? Even so, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. 1 Corinthians 9, 13 and 14. Christ commended the tithing system at the time he rebuked the scribes and Pharisees for their narrow-minded approach to religion. For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith, those you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Matthew 23, 23. Perhaps you're wondering how you could possibly give a tenth of your income to the Lord. Many people have wondered that. But then somehow they made the decision to trust God's guidance and wisdom and to return the tithe to Him. Weeks later, these same persons enthusiastically testified that a miracle had happened in their lives. Somehow, nine-tenths of their income stretched farther than ten-tenths ever did. Here is the secret to financial security. Some people ask, isn't tithing only for the Jews? To such we ask, are the blessings of heaven only for Jews? There was Jim who squeezed an honest tithe out of a scant paycheck. It seemed hard at first, but later he was blessed with his own business that flourished and brought financial security. Now he gives God the credit for his financial success and delights in giving to advance the Lord's work. Or take Ed, for example, who took a leap of faith by closing his business on Sabbaths, the busiest day of the season, only to be rewarded by increased business on the other six days of the week. God is a promise keeper. Such Christians have discovered firsthand the blessings promised in Malachi. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And prove me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Malachi 3.10 The Lord says the tenth of everything is holy to him. He gives us the privilege of returning it to him in order to test our stewardship to see if we will honor and acknowledge His ownership. If we refuse to do that, we are actually robbing God, according to the Bible. But you might say, In what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. Malachi 3, 8. While the tithe, or tenth part of our income, belongs to God, we are invited to give abundantly, even beyond that portion which is already rightfully God's. With offerings, it's left up to each of us to decide how far our generosity is to extend. However, there are some guidelines in the Bible. Jesus said, Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Luke 6, 38. God's plan for financing His work on earth is simple and beautiful. He asks His people to give from their hearts, never fearing for their own needs, which will ultimately be met far beyond expectation. Perhaps you're thinking, if God owns everything, the gold, silver, cattle, the land, and us, why does He need my money? The tithing system is God's plan for financing His work on earth. He never intended the church to be financed by lotteries, bingo games, or raffles. And isn't tithing a responsible way to finance the ministry? Each person gives according to what he receives. If you earn $1,000, you return $100 to God. If you earn 100 you return $10. Could anything be fairer? But perhaps more important than financing God's work is the benefit the giver receives. As we return the tithe to God, we express our appreciation for what He has done for us, and we become less self-centered and greedy. We become more concerned for the poor, the sick, the orphans, and the widows. And as we share our blessings with them, we grow in love and compassion, becoming more and more like Jesus. That is God's plan for our growth in Christ. Jesus told wonderful stories to illustrate His teaching. Here is one of the most interesting. A diligent, industrious farmer worked hard and had a tremendous crop at harvest time. 
The harvest was so great that his barns couldn't contain it. They were already bursting, and the crop wasn't in yet. What could he do? It was a dilemma. He struggled over the decision. Should he give the excess to the poor? But it was his. Had he not been the one who planned carefully and used his wisdom and agricultural expertise to make this the most prosperous farm in the valley? He convinced himself of what to do. I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Luke 12, 18 and 19. But God said to him, You fool! This night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasures for himself and is not rich toward God. Luke 12, 20 and 21. This rich farmer did not acknowledge where his blessings came from. He did not recognize his creator or his obligation as a steward. He utterly forgot the poor, the orphans, the widows, or homeless. He thought only of himself. This man had a heart problem. Jesus said, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Matthew 6, 21. Jesus was very serious about our attitude toward our possessions. For if not surrendered to Jesus, they could lead us away from God, even resulting in the loss of eternal life. He said, What is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Matthew 16, 26. The problem with modern man is that his life has become so complex and his schedule so busy that he either forgets or does not take time to remember where all his blessings come from. He fails to consider the price that was paid to redeem him from sin. As a result, he neglects to honor God with his time, talents, and his treasures. Each of us needs to be reminded daily that the things that we love and hold dear to our hearts are just borrowed. They're not ours at all. So remind us, remind us, dear Lord, 